Welcome back young scholars. In this video we will be discussing Western Europe in the Middle Ages, so the period from 600 CE to 1450 CE, sometimes better known as the Dark Ages. So the big questions you should be able to answer after watching this video are first, why are the Middle Ages also called the Dark Ages? And then what is the problem with using that term? Second, how did the political order of Western Europe change with the collapse of the Roman Empire? Third, what are the cultural continuities and changes in Western Europe in the Middle Ages? And then fourth, how is order maintained in a feudal society? So that first big question, why are the Middle Ages also called the Dark Ages, and what is the problem with using that term? So first of all, we have to understand the Middle Ages. So the Middle Ages is a term used to describe the period between the fall of the Western Roman Empire, which was in 476, and the beginning of the Renaissance, and there's some debate about when that began, this period of rebirth of classical Greek and Roman ideas. For purposes of this class, we'll say around 1500 CE. So all that time in between is sometimes referred to as the Middle Ages, between these two period, or the Dark Ages. And the idea of the Dark Ages is really you're entering in with the collapse of the Roman Empire, a period where darkness descends on <laughs> Western Europe. And they remain kind of in that darkened state of despair until they reach the Renaissance or the rebirth of classical Greek and Roman ideas. So the Middle Ages, also known as the Dark Ages, was this period of European history that lasts from 476 CE, the fall of the Western Roman Empire, to 1500 CE, the start of the Renaissance. Now, why is it called the Dark Ages? Well, during the Dark Ages in Europe, Western Europe experienced fewer technological and cultural advancements. One way to kind of think about this is if, you know, technology is kind of like a spigot. Sometimes you have eras like the classical era where you had, you know, the ancient Greeks, the Romans, who were developing all of these new innovations, these ideas, like philosophy and mathematics and art and architecture, aqueducts, different forms of government, democracy, the republican form of government. This spigot of technology of innovation is really shut off with the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. At least that's how the narrative is portrayed during the Middle Ages. And instead you just kind of get a couple of drops, like improved wheelbarrows. <laughs> for peasants to use. And the water wheel was created during this Middle Age period. The three field system, which actually is pretty useful. And then all of this innovation and technology is then reborn with the Renaissance. At least that's how the this sort of simplistic narrative of history goes. But as you can guess, it is oftentimes far more complex than that. There were decreased educational opportunities for people, um, increased illiteracy rates, less written records being produced during this period. Again, we can sometimes overstate these kind of claims. Certainly there were less educational opportunities, but in actuality, the, the beginnings of the university system in Western Europe was started during this period. And eventually those seeds of educational opportunities will eventually blossom in later periods. There were increased foreign invasions. The Vikings, for example, the Islamic State was pushing into parts of Western Europe and Spain. And so certainly that's a reason to consider this period dark. There was increased spread of diseases like the bubonic plague during the mid-1300s, unlucky 13. There was decreased transregional trade, but that actually has to do more with Europe's poor geographic location on Eurasia. Remember, Europe is actually relatively geographically isolated over there when it comes to Silk Road trade. There's really no direct connection to Indian Ocean trade. And so Europe was basically just geographically isolated during this period. There was diminished population, especially in cities like Rome. However, again, it's kind of more complex. During certain periods, like the High Middle Ages, which was between 1000 and 1300 CE, population was actually increasing in Europe because 
of warmer temperatures. That's all going to change with the Little Ice Age, which really began around 1300 CE. And so we're going to see decreased population as a result of disease and also less food that's being produced as a result of the Little Ice Age from 1300 to 1500. So what's the problem with using the term Dark Ages? Well, for one thing, as we just mentioned, it, it sort of creates this oversimplistic narrative of history. A second major problem is that it focuses entirely on Western Europe, right? And it doesn't take into account the fact that things were going really well in the Islamic State, the Islamic Caliphates, in Sui Tong Song, China, in the Mongol Empire, so East Asia, the Middle East was actually doing relatively well during this period, and so it's not dark for them. The Americas, we haven't talked about it yet, but the Maya, the Aztec, the Incas are all making significant advancements and creations. In Africa, we have Ghana, we have Mali, these wealthy African kingdoms. <laughs> In Australia, there's just hunting and gathering mainly going on during this period. So this focus on Europe, right, is problematic and it is something that we try to avoid in this class. It's an example of Eurocentric history. We focus exclusively on Europe without taking into consideration the broader context of what's going on in Asia or Africa or the Americas. How did the political order of Western Europe change with the collapse of the Roman Empire? So you'll recall the Roman Empire spanned the, almost the entire Mediterranean. It was divided into two parts. Eventually the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, would continue on. The Western Roman Empire would break up into some various kingdoms. It would become highly localized and fragmented. These decentralized states that were established mainly by these Germanic invaders, like the Kingdom of the Franks, the Kingdom of the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Saxons, the Celts. Attempts were made occasionally to reestablish a larger empire in the same model of the Roman Empire. For example, there was this Carolingian Empire that was founded by Charlemagne, the King of the Franks. And this briefly reunified most of Western Europe around 800 CE. Charlemagne was crowned emperor by the Pope. So the fact that Charlemagne is crowned emperor by the Pope should suggest something to you. Who has the most power in Western Europe during this period? Is it the king or is it the Pope? It's definitely the Pope, right? The church has lots of power and authority during this period. So this empire doesn't last very long, but it included most of modern day France, Germany, and Italy. This is going to be important later on in history when we study folks like Napoleon and Hitler, who both looked up to Charlemagne and tried to emulate his attempts to reunify Europe. Both of these guys are going to invade. So Napoleon's going to invade Germany and Hitler's going to invade France and both sort of have this vision of a unified Europe in the same way that the Carolingian Empire under Charlemagne built. It's later going to be renamed the Holy Roman Empire, which is like the worst name in world history because it was not particularly holy. There was actually a fair amount of separation between the church and the state in Western Europe during this period. It wasn't particularly Roman because the city of Rome wasn't really ever a part of the Holy Roman Empire. It later on will focus more on Germany. It arguably isn't really an empire. It's not that big. And so not holy, not Roman, not an empire. And yet it's called the Holy Roman Empire. So near the end of the Middle Ages, Western Europe is going to start to organize into various nation states based upon shared language and culture. So for example, France will form and the boundaries will be determined based upon the people who speak the French language, the people in Spain that speak Spanish or Portugal, the people that speak Portuguese. So this shared language and culture is going to lead to the formation of the first nation states in Western Europe. Now, kings are going to gain more power over time. 
they're going to have more power than these feudal lords, these wealthy aristocratic landholders. And we'll talk more about that in a second. We'll talk about feudalism. But these kings are going to, over time, and gradually gain more and more power and become absolute rulers. For example, King John. Now, the problem with absolute power is absolute power corrupts absolutely. So it's easy for a ruler with absolute power to turn into a tyrant. And so King John is going to abuse his power. He's going to make enemies, especially among the aristocratic landholding class in England at the time. This was in the 1200s, by the way. So these lords, these wealthy landowners, are going to force John to sign the Magna Carta. And eventually they're going to create another document establishing a parliament as a check on the king's authority. And so this is going to be important because we're going to start seeing this more and more. The creation of legal documents for the purpose of creating limits on power, right? We know of this in the United States with the formation of the Constitution, especially the Bill of Rights. This is going to become very important later on when we study the Enlightenment, these limitations that are placed on the power and authority of the ruler. So during the Middle Ages, Western Europe is going to constantly be attacked by these powerful outside invaders. You have the Islamic State again pushing across North Africa and then into Spain and the Iberian Peninsula, known as Al-Andalus. The Islamic Empire is eventually stopped by a guy named Charles the Hammer Martel in the Battle of Tours in 732. And then over time, we're going to gradually see these Christians living in northern Spain and France push back the Islamic State in Spain during what's known as the Reconquista, or the recapturing of the Iberian Peninsula by Christian forces. These were basically invaders coming in from the south, the Islamic State, and then from the north you have the Vikings. So you can see the route of Viking invasions. You can see oftentimes they were bringing their ships up rivers. This region over here, what's known as the Kievian Rus, which is the beginnings of Russia, is actually where the first Russians are going to intermix with the Vikings. So who are these Vikings? Well, first of all, they were from Scandinavia, which is this region right here, modern day Norway, Sweden, Denmark. They were seafaring explorers. They were warriors. Merchants, oftentimes their purpose was trade. The climate in Scandinavia is very cold, and so there's not very good farmland. And so the Vikings needed to go out, and in the process, oftentimes they raided regions. So they attacked and raided towns and villages across Europe. Oh, this image just makes me a little nauseous. So this is a Viking helmet, although it's completely and totally incorrect. Historically incorrect. The Vikings never wore horns on their helmets. Horns would be very easy to grab in battle and provide a very big target. So the Vikings were not that stupid. They didn't wear horns and hel on their helmets. So that's why if I'm ever the commissioner of the NFL, my very first order will be to remove those horns from the Vikings' helmet. So the Vikings did their raiding using these versatile wooden long ships with this very you know, shallow hull that allowed them to get upriver, and oftentimes attack, especially monasteries where there were lots of wealth and there were very few people who could forcefully defend the monasteries. Um, and so they oftentimes would attack these soft targets using these wooden longships and using kind of the surprise attack tactics. So they briefly traveled to and settled in North America. So they initially settled in Iceland and then eventually they moved over to Greenland. So there's evidence that definitively establishes Viking settlements or the modern day region of Newfoundland up in Canada. So we have evidence that the Vikings settled in the Americas, but they didn't stay there very long. They eventually are going to return. So as a result of watching this video, you should be able to answer these first two big questions. Why are the Middle Ages also called the Dark Ages? And what is the problem with using that term? And then how did the political order of Western Europe change with the collapse of the Roman Empire? Thanks for watching.